I want to say that if you are under the age of 18, cover your ears now or get off the podcast because this is not going to be aimed towards small children. Welcome, everyone. This is Ryan Rash, and this is our special edition Beyond the Circus episode that we are going to discuss everything politics and the election that's coming up in 62 days. So, Dale Hummel is here with me. How are you doing, Dale? I'm great, Ryan, and and I appreciate the disclosure. See, life is good. See, y'all don't understand this, but Dale has to suppress his liberal tendencies through all things in life. (laughs) And so, therefore, we had a little bit of a disagreement this morning over some of this stuff. And so I had to give a disclaimer that no small children need to listen to this. And if they do, they do at their own risk. And so now Dale's liberal tendencies are suppressed and we can move on with the show. And it's going to be an exciting show. Is it? Well, let's see about that, Mr. Hummel. Here we are, 62 days away from the election. How are you feeling, sir? I'm still nervous, but uh, optimistic that, that there's some gaps closing and Trump is, is slowly working his way up in the polls. Clearly, over the last two weeks, both sides have had their ability to make their case and put it out there for four days in a row. And I guess we can just start with the Democratic National Convention, which, you know, they had a whole bunch of Hollywood celebs and lots of politicians and people like that on there. And I don't think it's really worth going back through and giving specific instances on who they were, what they talked about, because they talked about a whole bunch of nothing. Because all they said was, Joe Biden is a good human being, and you know Joe, and that Trump is a racist piece of trash. And so that was their whole point of four nights of the Democratic National Convention. That, that, that's what I got out of it, at least. I am either ignorant or so biased I'm blind to the message because other than saying that he's a nice guy, I couldn't get a lot of agenda out of it. I had to go online to search for Joe Biden's agenda. And most of what he's putting out there is, in my mind, just one promoting one lie after another. And again, maybe I'm the one that's confused, but it it just seems so simple that you can do some research yourself. And most of what he's putting out there is a falsity. And if I think about the the convention, I fortunately was camping, so I didn't get to see it live, but I went back and, and did the recaps, and it looked like it's Hollywood elites coming in to talk about what a good guy Joe Biden is versus the Republican convention where we brought real people with real stories out. It's a very clear difference, and I have a very strong preference. Well, there was no agenda at the Democratic National Convention. They did not talk about an agenda. They did not mention the agenda because if you actually go to it and look at it, it is basically the Bernie Biden manifesto. And Biden and the DNC has, in my opinion, taken most of Bernie's policies and AOCs and said that that's what we're going to do. I did think it was somewhat interesting that they had like almost 4,000, I don't know exactly what the delegate total was, but one-third of the Democratic National Convention delegates voted against the agenda. And I'm assuming that they voted against it because it was too liberal. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe no, they- I, I think you're dead on. And <laughs> Maybe it was the other way. <laughs> you, you would think it's because the other direction, but it's not. I believe they voted against because he wasn't far enough to the extreme. I, I don't know. I want to assume it's that way, but I think you're right. I think it wasn't progressive enough for the fruitcakes and snowflakes that make up that party. But I don't know what else they want, because if you actually dive into that, even though there was no mention of this at all during their convention, he adopted the Green New Deal. Your Second Amendment's going to go away. I mean, everything that Bernie and the squad and all them have talked about, it's in there in pretty much their form. There's not a whole lot of watering down. There's not a lot of moving to the middle, but it's there. So I I don't know what else, how more progressive they want it to be, but. It appears as though 
when I dig into to looking at his website and, and some of the policy slash agenda, those policies are pandering very, very much to the extreme left. Then we come out on his commercials and the little bit he's out in public, he seems to try to sway it a little more towards the, the middle. And maybe that's because the polls are shifting and he's trying to shift with that. But it's not possible to pander to the middle and pander to that extreme left. And he's trying to do that. In my mind, it's going to going to implode in his face. It can't be done. When I look at his agenda, we talk about things just like Ryan said. He says, let's let's open the borders. No wall. Basically, immigration as we know it, it doesn't exist. Just come across the border and and you have health care. You have basically citizenship. And in some cases, I pay an extreme amount, or our family does, for health insurance that covers very little. Yet if we were illegal aliens, that would be covered a hundred percent at no charge. I don't get it. His agenda talks about doubling the the minimum wage, promote union organization via creating a cabinet level position. He touts that Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer put the health and safety of the American public before any political gain. And I don't even want to try to go down that path, but it's a big one. It's just amazing. And he comes out everywhere on his website and says, let's stop willful misinformation. And I'm reading this one lie after another or incorrect statements that I, 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 I'm either confused or there's something missing. The most interesting, and we haven't talked about the RNC convention yet, but the most interesting thing that I found about this is there was no talk of agenda or policy. It basically was Joe's good, Trump's evil, which whatever. But they had like almost five months to plan and prepare for this because they decided long ago that they were going to go virtual and not have an in-person convention. And they had every Hollywood TV mogul at their disposal. And yet, this was the most stupid, glorified Zoom call in the history of the world. There were so many technical glitches, and it was just bad production and bad TV. And I, I, I don't understand how with all this preparation and planning and all these people that are supposed to be mega forces in the entertainment industry, this was the best that they could come up with. Shockingly bad is, is the, the word for it. I, I could not believe it. it. Almost to the point where it was so in my mind, unprofessional and poorly done, I was nervous the Republican one would come out very similar, thinking that it can't be done, and then boom, the, the opposite happens. There was one thing I did want to bring out, and, and Ryan, what do you think of the, this perfect example of elitism? I found digging through Joe Biden's policy, he wants to implement a surveillance program to make sure to implement testing for those who do not know they need to be tested. Basically telling us what we need again, that the same thing that we go back to and that push towards socialism, the general public doesn't know. Only the elite left politicians know what's best. And that infuriates me. I didn't know that that was in there. And I don't understand that. And again, this brings up another point. I'm not going to call the university out by name, but I have several friends at several universities across the country. And a couple of them have reached out to me in the past couple of days saying that those universities are now going to have like a lottery where if your name comes up, you have to be tested for coronavirus. I don't know how that's legal. I don't know how it's legal either. I know my son was strongly encouraged, if not required, to get a corona test prior to attending in-person classes. And I, like you, are visiting with other college professors across the country there's one university that they're testing these students twice a week. And it's, it's incredible that the numbers that we're, we have coming back. And I don't know. I, I foresee most of those in-person classes bumping to online, and partially because the majority of the instructors are definitely on the left side of the platform and, and would prefer to go that direction anyway. I just don't understand how they can make someone – Submit to a test. I, I don't get that. I don't understand it. I mean, I can see where if you had to go in person 
to class, you could, but all of these are pretty much, you can do whatever way you want. So I still don't understand how they can make college students submit to a test. That's where we're at on that. The one thing that I did want to bring up about the Demon Rats Donkey Show convention (laughs) that we all, or I got to witness in its full glory, is when Elizabeth Warren spoke, she was in a classroom, and over to the right of her was Black Lives Matter BLM right there. I, I thought that was quite, quite interesting that they were that bold to put that out there for everyone to see that they want to be affiliated with it that badly. And this is that double standard. We want to pander towards the Black Lives Matters to get that vote, yet we want to come back and denounce the rioting and so forth. And I'm not saying that Black Lives Matter is the one, are the ones that are contributing to the riots, but I have no question those protests, when nightfall comes, it takes a different direction. And, and I'm sure some of those same people out there in the daytime are probably some of the same ones at night, and I'm sure some new ones are coming out as well. But it's, it's an issue, and it's an issue that is hard for me to even, even accept, that they'll push that out there, and then the next day, or once polls say that, that it's not popular to not denounce the riots and so forth, all of a sudden we, we come out. Nothing is said during the DNC to denounce any of the riots or this is a problem. Then all of a sudden, a week or so later here, the last few days, Joe Biden is trying to make that one of his priorities. A little bit he speaks, he's speaking about that, and it's a total 180 from where he was. It's because it's backfiring. They had four days and not one speaker uttered one word of any of the riots, looting, vandalism, or mass chaos and nonsense that has been going on out there. But then after the RNC had their convention and took the complete total opposite stance on that, they realized, oh, we might have fucked up here and now they're going to do something different. But that leads us into... The RNC, because I I mean, I'm not trying to not give the Democrats their due, but there literally was no substance to talk about or anything policy or agenda-wise to that was covered in their convention. So we can just move on to the <laughs> RNC couple, now. I, I do what? have a couple more points to make on that. And again, oh, you're right. Well, it wasn't it ahead. was not covered in the convention. But he when when you dig into this, and I and I can understand why they're not throwing it out in the public because the moderates are gonna back away. But when you have AOC and John Kerry in charge of a climate working group, when you have Beta O'Rourke taking control of the of the gun laws and, and taking the lead on that, you have issues with the, the middle America. It's just it is not gonna happen. And then we we hear these flip-flops on Joe. He talks, comes out now and says, I'm not stopping fracking. Well, we have quotes from him basically in the debate. Bernie Sanders saying, I'm not allowing fracking. Joe says, me too. Where's he at? Joe, where are you? I I know we take a poll and decide and change, but someone's got to call him out on that. And fortunately, there there are a few on Fox News doing just that. But trying to pander both directions is really, really causing a problem. What about I'm not defunding the police? When another interview, Joe comes out and we need to reallocate dollars from police to other programs, but he's not defunding the police. I get a little bit a little bit cranky about all those things. And I have one more prediction to make that Crazy Joe is going to continue to talk about the debates as though they're going to take place. And at the last minute, he's going to bail on it. And well, I've thought this for, for a couple months, and, and I, I'm very fearful it's going to happen. Will that hurt him? It will, but it won't hurt him as much as actually going through a debate with President Trump because that would be brutal, absolutely brutal. We've talked about this privately, and I disagree with that. Like, again, I'm not saying that you're not correct, that he may not try to flake out on the debates, which we know that Pelosi, who is actually the leader of the Democrats, has stated that she does not think there needs to be a debate, that there's no sense in it, Trump's a pathological liar, shouldn't give him any credence and do this. And so when she said that last week, I knew that that was where this train was starting to go down the tracks. But you think it won't hurt him. The Democrats are going to vote for Beijing Biden 
and the Republicans are going to vote for Trump. It's those undecided people and the ones that are on the fence that may not love Trump's tone or his tweets, but or the Democrats are like, I just don't know if this guy is all there. It's that very, it's the independents and those ones on either side of the party that are unsure that are actually going to decide the election. And I truly believe that if he flakes out and says he's not going to debate, that will be the death knell for him in that section of the population that is still on the fence or undecided. Because if you don't have the nuts to go up there and debate like they have done for decades now, you clearly are not confident enough in yourself, much less confident enough to run the country. You are correct. It it will hurt him. And I think it will hurt him with that exact segment of the population that you're talking about. But I think it'll hurt him less than what it will if he goes up there. If, If Trump gets up there and brings out his true agenda, if he brings out that under Joe Biden, you'll be ticketed to going to church, but you can go protest and riot, and that's perfectly okay. Or if he brings out that there'll be a 100-day moratorium on any deportation or any of these radical agenda items that, that Joe has, when Trump brings that to the attention of the public in a debate where hopefully a good portion of the voting public is actually listening and Joe has to try to defend that, it is not going to work in any means. And I do believe that Trump's holding back one secret weapon, and I, and I, I hope this is true. Any time that Joe Biden is asked about his son Hunter's involvement overseas, he blows up. He goes ballistic, loses his temper on a, on a poor person in one of those town hall meetings. And if Trump can use that as a trigger, and I, I noticed he hasn't jumped on that bandwagon yet, and I'm hoping that he's saving it for the debate, I think that, that Joe will, will just lose it and, and go off the deep end. So I, I hope the debates happen. I really, really hope they do. And if they don't, I hope Ryan's correct that it'll put enough of a nail in the coffin just for the fact that he's not willing to stand up there. I believe you'll have Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, other voices in the Democrat Party come out and say, well, there's no reason to debate. Trump's just going to lie. That's that's where the excuse is going to fall. I don't think you'll get three like you're supposed to. I think you'll get one. And I think one can be enough. And I, I think I, one would do it. I think it'd be a home run. I, I think because after that one, they will definitely see what a moron he is. And whether he blows up or not, he can't stand up there for two hours. He can barely give a 24 minute speech in front of a to- teleprompter to an empty room as of yesterday. And then he walks off and doesn't take any questions. He can't stand up there for two hours and debate against Trump on policy. Cause I'm not even sure he knows all the policies that he supposedly adopted. Uh, but I don't think it'll happen. And after that one and Trump destroys him, then they're going to be like, Oh, all he did was lie. And th- there won't be any more, but I, you might get one. Hopefully you get one, but the jury's still out on that. I, I think the first one's scheduled for the 29th, if I'm, I, I might have that date wrong. But So it's getting closer, but uh, it will be very, very interesting to see how all this unfolds. And then, you know, typically in, on an election, presidential election year, the real hard campaigning doesn't really start till after Labor Day, and we're about there. So it's going to be really interesting to see if there are any October, September surprises and how this is going to unfold over the next two months because lots of stuff can happen and change. And as we saw in 2016, every day it was like a new political bombshell. So there's lots of time left, but... Moving on now to the Republican National Convention. Dale, you weren't playing Troop Beverly Hills during that, and you did get to participate, so I will let you. It was so good. I, I, if I would have missed that, I would have been, it would have been terrible. Give us your highlight reel there, sir. It's easy. Night one. After night one, I was probably as excited about this campaign, the fact that Trump was going to come back in the polls, and we're going to have him for another four years. It was amazing. I mean, they put real people out there with real stories. I I could go through a list of them that just 
just incredible to me. And the fact that they, they hit it home, they, when they would have the, the opening, the videos in the opening, I don't know, at least two, maybe three of the nights of the Republican National Convention, I choked up, teared up a little bit. It sounds crazy, but if I go to one of my children's sporting events and they play the national anthem, it's all I can take to hold back. And same thing right here, watching the convention. It was, it was incredible. I was at least glad that they did have prayer and a lot of patriotism. Uh, we did give the Pledge of Allegiance each night, which at the Democrat convention, you do realize that they took out the words under God from the pledge. Not once, but twice. Took it out. Mm-hmm. Removed I'm it. surprised they even had the Pledge of Allegiance. No, well, I mean, you know. That, that probably did not make the far left very happy. Slight adaptation, the words under God, but they, <laughs> they, they did have it. So Demon Rats had said after their convention, which they thought was just amazing, how the Republican convention was going to be terrible because Trump had not decided to go virtual until like a month before. And so they have no time to prepare. It was going to be awful. No way they could get it together. I mean, they were confident that they had produced and put out there a far superior product. And the first night happens, and again, the the video presentations and the Cardinal giving the prayer, all of the normal, everyday American heroes that told their story and why they were supporting Trump and how Trump's administration had helped them or their business, all that goes down. And the first night after it's over and they're giving the recap on Fox, literally you could see Donna Brazil and your brother Juan, and they're literally <laughs> like shaking and twitching in their little chairs. And I can't, Chris Wallace, who I'm not a real big fan of, said something about how he was surprised at how good the production was. There were no technical glitches, you know, like there were some visible ones in the Democrats. And uh, I think Britt Hume said, <laughs> said it best. And he said, you all do realize that before Donald Trump ran for president, he had a highly successful career in television and especially reality TV. So why y'all didn't think this was going to be good is kind of confusing to me. It's incredible. And, and, and even, even the MSNBC, CNN, I'm not saying they didn't go negative after night one and, and try to pick it apart, but there wasn't much ground they could, they could even grasp, even talking to the, to the left. It, it was amazing. Speaking of the DNC, what about their glitch where they have the Hollywood squares come up on the screen for the applause and three or four of them are duplicated? Four of them were duplicated. <laughs> and it was multiple times. Multiple How? times. How could something like that slip through the cracks? That, that lack of professionalism does not bode well for somebody that's running for president. Does not. I just think they couldn't find that many people to fill the screen. Which of the, the real world speakers, the, the real people heroes, which one did you like the best? Your favorite was the Cuban immigrant guy, wasn't Maxima. he? Maxima. Maxima Avarez. Yeah. And- oh, touching. Touching. Cuban-born, 100% American. Plea for people to better understand what direction Biden-Harris ticket may take the country. Just his deep appreciation for being American, where a lot of us that, that take it for granted need to just step back, take a deep breath, and realize what we have living in this country compared to most the countries in the world. Fox didn't cover that speech in its entirety, but I saw the highlights of it, and it was very, very moving. I guess of the actual real world ones i thought alice johnson was as good as any of them and uh i i just thought that she probably resonated and that her story probably resonated with more people that are in that undecided group than anyone else and so i guess i thought that was a home run for me in terms of the real world everyday heroes i thought probably the most effective person for Trump and reaching out to the minority community and the undecided voters and those people was Herschel Walker. When 
he talked about their 40-year friendship, or maybe it's 30-year, I don't know, very long, lengthy friendship, and how Herschel took Donald's kids to Disney World one time, and Donald didn't think he was going to get it to make it, but eventually he did, and how they rode the It's a Small World ride, and he was there in his suit. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he was from the South, and he knows what racism is. He's seen it. He's confronted it. He's been around it, and that Donald Trump is not a racist. I, I thought that on night one. I, I don't know if anything surpass that in terms of hitting that targeted audience that they need to better than anything else. No, I think he absolutely nails it. And and you're right. I don't, I don't know that you could have put a better person up there considering how he presented himself and the points that he hit on. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if those people were watching, but I don't think you could have put forth anyone to speak any more clearly on the topic with logic and with some facts and with some experience. It, w- it was really, really good. I, I appreciate it. There was a, a logger that came on, Scott Dane, talks a little bit about uh, managing forest versus wildfires and how the, the Biden administration would, would eliminate the logging. And in long term, it's going to come around and bite us in the ass, similar to what we're seeing in California with all the wildfires. But really, really good. And there's a couple of younger Republicans out there that we aren't going to call real people or real citizens, but more politicians. But what I like about one of them is she doesn't come across as a politician. Who am I talking about, Ryan? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the illustrious governor from South Dakota. Oh, she's amazing. She needs to be on the ticket. I don't care which position on the ticket in the very near future for president. Dale, you just like her because she's hot. She she is. She's on a horse with an American flag in one of the, the commercials. Her speech, it was basically a, a constitutional 101 speech. Educate the world on the Constitution. And I think that's needed. She is just absolutely true. I, I appreciate what she's done in South Dakota. I appreciate her intelligence. I appreciate her ability to speak. And as Ryan puts it, she's she's pretty pretty impressive in terms of just so a nice she person. looked like Jabba the Hutt. Would you still be that impressed with her? I would still be that impressed with everything that I said, but Lies. in all honesty, I do not know. I do not think she would come across as strong with as a political figure. I don't think she'd get the vote. I'm not saying it's correct. I'm just saying you're you're right. It it wouldn't wouldn't go as far. But what what she stands for and, and the fact that she gave that speech and reminded the world about the Constitution, it it resonated with me very, very well. And who do we put on the ticket with her? I have another suggestion. We got to win this selection first. So, <laughs> all right, all right. Cool your jets there, Tonto. Uh, <laughs> I do think that what she has done about keeping South Dakota open is amazing. And I think that is probably going to get her further after this is all over than anyone else. And I don't know if that was her in her intentions or she was just trying to keep her state open. But I think the fact that she's the only governor that never shut down and they've, of course, you know, South Dakota, it's a different place. I mean, people live 200 miles apart and they call each other neighbors. So it's probably easier to keep the Rona down there. But she has done a really good job. And I do think it has propelled her into the Republican spotlight. And I do think that she will be a strong, strong possibility of someone that will be on the ticket in 2024. Uh, Talking about the politicians that spoke there, there were lots of them that spoke at both conventions. I think the biggest contrast that you saw is the ones that were highlighted in the Republican convention. There were several of them. There was the attorney general from Kentucky. There was, I can't think of the young man's name, but anyway, he's 25. He's running for Congress. He is paralyzed from the waist down, but he gave a really stirring speech. And then there was several of them, but they were all of the younger generation for the most part. And I guess the way that it came across to me is DNC put up the same 
I mean, like, AOC got to speak for one minute at the Democratic National Convention. One minute. She is literally the person that those morons listen to the most. Like, literally, she comes on the screen and they go, how Hitler? I mean, that, that's how that works. <laughs> and what did but, she say in that minute, Ryan? What did she say? Oh, she nominated Bernie. And did anybody bring this up afterwards? Did, did no, the news? No. Made, how is this possible? They just glazed over it. Just whoop. <laughs> Techni- another technical glitch. Your 25-year-old is Madison Cawthorn, North Carolina. Go. Just amazing speech. Had Wants us to come out and have a discussion and really debate with no apologies for your beliefs. He was, he was good. Anyway, DNC put up the same tired old people, Hillary, Bill, Barack, Michelle, you know, Chuck, Nancy. Republicans had some of the current an old guard up there, but they had a whole bunch of new progressive Republicans. And what I came away with this was, no matter what happens in this election, the lights are a lot brighter in the Republican Party than they are in the Democrats. And this is no longer your mother's Republican Party. I mean, this, no, is, and- this is a new thing. It, this is a new deal. And this younger generation, what shocked me is, Nearly every one of them that they put out there came across so good and, and their ability to communicate and, and, and resonate with, with people like myself. I was, I was overwhelmed. I, I can't even put into words how excited I am about, about some of those that came out and spoke. Oh, Daniel Kim Cameron. Classic, the, you love her. I forgot oh, about her. She, w- she was good that Daniel Cameron, the Kentucky attorney general, I mean, his powerful speech that he talks about the color of my speech. Again, does not mean he should have to vote for Joe Biden. And, and just, I mean, the way he put words together, he may be the one that'll be on the ticket with uh, Christy Nome at some point. Uh, he's, he's good, really, really good. I thought it was so, the c- contrast between the two, all of this younger generation of Republicans who they were all new and fresh, and, but they still completely backed our president, the ideals of the Republican Party, maybe not, you know, as in the way that we used to, but they have a new fresh take on it, but they were still 120,000% behind Trump. Where if we go over to the Democrats, AOC and the squad, yeah, they've said that they're going to support Sleepy Joe, but there's a whole bunch of division in there. Again, you can see because one third of them did not vote to accept their agenda and their policy for the president. But like when the primaries were going, AOC, the squad, those are, they were Bernie bros to the fullest. And it took them a long, long time, even after Bernie conceded to say that they were going to support Biden. So I think there's a whole lot more unity and there's a lot more rising stars is what I got out of it. I follow that 100% and, and we're biased. I'm biased at least. I'm going to speak for myself. So I, I wanted all these things to happen. I just couldn't believe it did. And it even went beyond what my expectations were. And, and the fact that they would have one speaker after another that just absolutely nailed it. I believe there was one gentleman that had searched out political asylum in China and the U.S., came on to speak and had a good story but was difficult to follow maybe. But outside of, of that one and, and the fact that his story was so good and the situation that he was in and how he brings up some of the issues with the Chinese Communist Party and, and what's really going on over there, I think really good maybe just didn't come across as, as sincere because of how directly contrasting it was but really, really good across the board, every one of them. And then we get into night four and what happens? Wow. I, I, again, I thought maybe it was too good on night one that we're going to have a hard time getting back there. But in, in my mind, it comes out on night four and, and just overwhelms me. Well, I agree with you on the guy from China. The other one, and again, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. I, I just didn't get the nun. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. And maybe that's just me. And 
uh, but I didn't understand why that one needed to be up there. She did a nice job. But again, I'm a big believer in keeping politics and religion separate, and so I thought that was a little weird. But night four came around, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I was I was concerned. I thought Ivanka was probably as good as anyone I've ever seen introduce presidential candidate ever. And I've seen a lot of them, even when I was a little boy. I thought she was absolutely just real, articulate. She was humorous at times, but yet she hit some very valid points, and she really took things that mattered and summed them up so, so well before Trump ever got out there. And I just thought she literally set the stage for what could be just a truly tremendous moment and event. And and it was, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. I was more impressed with her than I was Trump. I would agree with that. And in a couple statements, Washington has not changed Donald Trump. Donald Trump has changed Washington. Oh, and and you know what? It's it's a it's a powerful statement, and it's accurate. I mean, he's turned that place upside down. And we talk about draining the swamp. The Loch Ness monster, Joe Biden, forty-seven years. It's hard for me to accept the fact that there are people out there that don't do not realize he's been there that long, and really hasn't accomplished a great deal. Nothing that he can really hang his hat on and say, "Here's what I've done." And if he had done a lot of things, he surely would be doing that right now, that we're on the right side of things and successful. But if we, we keep talking about we want change, we want Washington, we want the, the lifelong politicians out of there, how is it even possible that, that Joe Biden is the Democrat candidate for president when we have all those things? The other Ivanka statement, you cannot expect to do the same thing and get different results. I mean, a couple statements that she's made like those, wow, 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 wow. All the Trump children did very well at speaking, but she literally blew it away. I guess my other favorite, even though she's not exactly a Trump child, she is a daughter-in-law, was Laura Trump. And uh, I thought she was just another one. The, the, out of everyone, even the everyday heroes, those two might have been my two most favorite speakers of the entire convention. And... uh what Laura Trump said about believe nothing what you hear, only half of what you read, and only the things that you are there for in person, that really, really resonated with me. Not just about Trump and the media, but as a whole in my life and the things that I've had to come up against and deal with, I that probably hit me harder than any other line that came out of the convention. I can, I can agree with that. And the fact that Laura, to me, painted a real picture that she came from the outside, not knowing what the Trump family was like. And I think she told a very good story of the Donald Trump that is not being portrayed by the media, that actually cares about family, will take the time to do what he can to sit down and listen. And we heard some of the same things from the real people that were brought forth that have had any contact with Donald Trump. And again, is he a little rough? Is he tweeting some things that maybe are, are not as politically correct and not as appropriate as past presidents? Absolutely. But let's get down to his heart, his ability to stand up and do what he believes. There's not another person on this planet that could take the abuse coming from the mainstream media and still charge forward. I'm overly impressed. And when he got up there and spoke, I thought he did a very nice job. Maybe not as dynamic, maybe not as much energy. Maybe there's some things there, but it was a relatively long speech, so it's hard to keep that, that energy level up there. But he went out and he just, boom, here's what I've accomplished in the past four years. Here's what I plan to do moving forward and was able to hit on so many different avenues and policies and the agenda that he put out that he promised he would do during the campaign and followed through on. Those things are important to me, and it was just almost a list. A, B, C, D, here's what I've accomplished. Here's what I want to continue with. 
See, I disagree with you and the pundits on the energy thing because I did not feel like he was flat at all. I thought that he was trying to be extremely presidential, which is not exactly his gig, and he's not real good at it. But I think that he was trying to be extremely presidential, mainly more because of the setting of where that speech was. If he'd have been in a stadium or a hall or something like that, I don't think he would have been that worried about it. But being there at the people's house, using that as the stage for that speech, I think he really was trying his very best to be presidential. And the reason I say that, I don't think he was flat or didn't have any energy. You can't land one-liners like he did in terms of the fact that when he was talking about how Biden has been there for 47 years and he's taken their money and given them hugs and sometime kisses, that's the opposite of flat when you're throwing zingers <laughs> at somebody like that. I just think he was trying to be very presidential. And he has a tendency to borderline on angry and rage at some of those uh, rallies. And so I think he was trying to avoid that. I thought the speech was very good. I particularly liked the latter part of the speech where he would talk about Biden's agenda versus what he wanted to do. He was giving specific points of Biden's agenda and what a Biden America would look like versus what he wants to accomplish in the next four years and what he wants to do. He talked about tax cuts, 10 million jobs in 10 months. He went over that he wanted to slash more regulations in terms of red tape, in terms of business. He just made a very, very stark contrast in between what he wants to do and what Biden's agenda that they've kept hidden and in the dark actually will do. Uh, so that was the part of the speech that I really, really appreciated. I'm going to be the first to tell you it was too long. And for four days, they had gone over all of his accomplishments and what all he had accomplished in the first year of his presidency. And the one thing that he Trump made this statement the other day, and he's very correct. I don't think there is probably a president that has accomplished more of what he set out to do, what he said he was going to do when he ran in the primaries, in the general, and accomplished those things in three years. And it's got to be correct because you don't even hear the mainstream media balk or try to fact check that point. And so, no, they, they haven't even approached it. Right. And so that is there. I wish he would have just let everyone else do that for him instead of the first 30 minutes of that speech reiterating it. Because even though it wasn't as bad as sometimes, it's like him bragging on himself. And while he should be very proud of what he accomplished, he had four days of people singing those, singing that song and giving that chorus over and over again. We could have just left that out. And so that was the only thing that, I mean, I like hearing it. I'm fine with it. I don't know what the group that he's trying to get sway to voter, if that did any good for them. But other than that, I thought it was great. That analogy is perfect, Ryan. And I think that segment you talked about earlier, that, that independent middle of the road segment, I don't know if it is appealing and you're so correct. It would have been better. He had, he had had everybody up there for three nights, four nights talking about his accomplishments and bringing out stories of themselves and how they are personally affected. I think that Trump is so in tune with having to talk about what he's accomplished and, and combat the mainstream media that he's just used to doing that. But if he could have taken that out, simply talked about it maybe in a very general sense, what he's accomplished over the past four years and how it's going to continue into the future, that would have resonated better with that independent population and not bragging about himself. If he could step away from that and and let others do that for him and put out there, here's what he's accomplished, I think that suits the presidential election much better for him. And and there's so many more things. He he brought out clear choice to save American dream or adopt socialism. Um, he talks about how the Democrats spend so much time tearing down our country. That to me is is a hard one to swallow. 
Uh, we're basically a wicked nation that must be punished by its sins. That is what I, I truly feel some of the Democrat Party officials believe. And that's hard. I, I, I cannot accept that in any manner whatsoever. Trump talks about how he left a, for his former life, which was a really good life, how he kept his promise and, and, and the things we've already talked about from his campaign into his presidency. And even former Republican presidents, in my mind, haven't done that good a job of, of keeping that promise or being able to accomplish what they talked about. Amazing. He, he did point out how he stood up to, to China, how he's pro-American on, on immigration, most secure borders, 300 miles of border fence with 10 miles a day continuing. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about, and, and I, I don't know if he brought it up, I'm sure he did, but it's been brought up several times. He took big pharmacy on and, and basically said, okay, time out here. We're doing a lot of research to develop these drugs and these products. And I understand it takes a lot of research to get those FDA approved, and it is expensive. The problem with it is Big Pharma is putting the cost on most Americans in terms of what they pay for these pharmaceuticals at the drugstore, and then you can go to Mexico and buy it for 20% of the price what it costs in the States, and that's why a lot of people used to go to Mexico to get their prescription drugs. Same drug made here in the United States, we sell to Mexico cheaper than what we sell to the people here in the U.S., and many, many other countries across the world are getting what they call a favored nation discount. Trump has put out there and said, hey, pharmaceutical companies, I don't care what your price is for most favored nations out there, but whatever the lowest price you're giving to other countries, that is where we're going to pay. And I can assure you that is a huge hit to the pharmaceutical companies. And I agree with him 110%. I don't know that the pharmaceuticals can keep the prices where they're at. They're going to have to raise it a little bit on some of these other countries, but it's complete crap that we as consumers in the U.S. have paid for all this research and the production and the testing and all of these things to get these pharmaceuticals approved. And then all of a sudden, we're carrying the bill for the rest of the world. I'm out. Now, he did talk about Big Pharma in there, and I do think that's one of those things that of many of his accomplishments has gone under the radar and not acknowledged as much. But Probably they've ignored that one more than any because I think that one will probably resonate more with all people in America than most. Also, he's done amazing work in the opioid crisis, and it goes, I mean, you never hear any of it. No, and that nothing. is directly nothing. related to the big pharma, and uh, you hear nothing about it, but those are things like that after we get past these two conventions, we're going to talk about the general election and where we go from here. But just wrapping that up, I know that Dale was out there being, you know, Mr. Wilderness and during the demon rats. But I guess the way that I sum this up is a lot of y'all may follow me on Snapchat, may not. But during the Democrat one, like I would get so angry that they were just lying and not making any sense and just putting false narratives out there and never saying anything. I would literally rip these speakers on my Snapchat every night, like one right after another. And I can't do that on Facebook as much because I would be in Facebook jail. So I do Snapchat. And I was also sending Dale text throughout both of them, but of course he was, you know, being the troop leader at the campfire, so I didn't get anything back during the Democrat ones, but during the Republican, I never got on Snapchat because I was literally so interested in what all those people had to say, except for a couple of what the fuck moments, one was the nun and stuff like that, that I I didn't I didn't have time to get on Snapchat because I really wanted to hear what those people said. And it didn't matter if they were one of those everyday heroes or one of those politicians. I was interested, intrigued, and involved so much in that moment that there was no time for me even to praise them on Snapchat because I was listening to what they were putting out there. And so that was the... That sums up the difference in those two for me. I think that's 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 dead on track, and and I I I believe you have the comparison. Here's the Hollywood celebrities, 
and the old school politician standing up there in a poorly produced virtual convention versus a very well-run, highly produced presidential. I can't say enough positive about the Republican National Convention. The real people that came out and told the real stories on how Trump's presidency has affected their life. I think the contrast is you have the Democratic National Convention coming out there to try to say, as Ryan stated so well, Joe's a nice guy. Donald Trump isn't. Let's make him president. But when you when when Trump paints that picture that Democrats want us to believe that the police are driving around looking for a black man to shoot, when Nancy Pelosi comes out there and, and basically says there's voter intimidation, are you kidding me? When when the, the speech was over there at the White House on that concluding night, those guests that had to leave the White House area and walk to their hotels or get cabs, how intimidated they the the intimidation factor that was thrown in their face and and all the issues that took place there. I never want to hear anything about voter intimidation again. I, I've never agreed with it, but it's it's the exact opposite. And most of the things that Nancy Pelosi is saying, there can be something that comes out that is very clearly one direction, and she will flip it completely around, ignore all the facts, and say something totally different. And I'm assuming her base listens to her. The Democratic National Convention talks about global warming destroying the planet in 10 years. We talk about things that that I just can't even I can't even wrap my head around. It's very very difficult for me, but there's a huge contrast between the two conventions. I think that same contrast applies to both candidates, and I hope people take the time to do some research and think for themselves and and see what direction they go. I do have some comments on the vote by mail and we have some new polls that came out, but regarding the conventions, I think that Ryan has presented it as well as you possibly can. I know that that he and I are very biased. We're very conservative-minded. But I hope that our, our barn-blind conservatism isn't skewing basically the facts that are coming out between these two. First off, sir, I am not a Republican. I oh, am just sorry, not I a apologize. fucking Democrat. <laughs> <Not>. <laughs> I, I would say that I, I, I don't know if I want to call myself a Republican. I've voted Republican for a very long time. I think exactly. that, uh, I am never barn blind about anything. No, no, never. No, I no. am. I am. I am. I'm going to admit it. I, I am. And I, I probably no. not ever, I was exposed to politics in college. And then I spent 20 years in academia fighting the extreme other liberal left professors. And then once we developed more of our own business here, family businesses and how the tax laws and the philosophy affects my family, health insurance, I can go on and on. I become hypersensitive to political issues. And I am concerned. We've talked about a lot of differences. We know that the polls are closing. Again, who believes the polls? I do not know why you people are still putting stock in the polls. I don't understand it. I don't get it. The one thing that we should have learned from Hillary versus Trump was the polls were wrong. Not just a little wrong, not kind of wrong, completely, totally, unabashedly. Like, those people should have gone into a hole and never come out again. That's how screwed up, messed up wrong they were. I, d- I, don't, I don't believe in polls. And maybe in if they didn't involve Trump, you can look at them and whatever. In 2016, there was a huge number of the voters that were afraid to admit that they were going to vote for Trump or that they did vote for Trump. That is why the election literally turned everybody upside down on its ear. And one of the things that I kept telling people on social media back then is, and again, I didn't know that the polls were going to be as wrong as they were, but I knew that day after day, you could not continue to get crowds of 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 people all across America. And those people would sit there and wait in line overnight for hours at a time to hear Trump speak. I told people, there's no way those people aren't going to the polls. I still believe that. The other thing that I think is different now is 
I think it's even worse because Trump has been so polarizing as a president. Things are not easy either way. I think there's even a larger portion that does not want to say who they're voting for. The other thing that I truly believe more than anything is back when he was running against Hillary, there was a huge wave of people, and especially women, a lot of gay people, that they wanted to see the first woman president elected. And that was widely popular. They were enthusiastic about it. They were on a mission. Biden does not have that enthusiasm. The only reason people are voting for Biden in, is because he's not Trump. And so I think those that factor alone is going to play a large part in this election. Ryan, time out. You're trying to tell me that a portion of the gay population voted for Hillary because they wanted a woman in there. Absolutely. Are you trying to tell me there is another gay conservative out there? No, I'm saying a large portion of the gays really wanted the first woman president to be elected. And what where 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 is the gay vote now? They're probably still largely with Biden, but God. I'm telling you, I don't think you understand how much gay support Hillary had. I mean, no, I I can I can I, I remember some of that. And I am I'm optimistic that if you are even a little bit correct and you may be and I never thought about it this way. I was concerned that maybe the polls Back in 2016, Hillary against Trump were were maybe a little little more skewed than now. But you're thinking it's there's more intimidation now. People are more worried about saying, "Hey, I'm a Trump supporter," and you can see it. There's I think it's magnified double. Th- if that's the case, I have some numbers from 2016 when Hillary was was running against Trump at this same time frame. This week in 2016 in Wisconsin, Hillary had 11 and a half percent lead. Over Trump, Biden currently has a 3.5% lead, much less at this point. In Michigan, Hillary had a 9% lead over Trump. Joe currently holds a 2.6 point advantage. And in Pennsylvania, Hillary had over an eight point lead. Joe Biden currently has a 4.7. So if those polls are wrong, and Ryan, you're correct that people don't want to speak out and say they're Trump supporters, it is going to be very, very heavy in those swing states towards Trump. As of this week, Real Clear Politics comes out, Pennsylvania, Biden at 49%, Trump 44.3%. Florida, Biden 49%, Trump 45.3%. Michigan, Biden 47.3%, Trump 44.7%. In North Carolina, Trump has actually taken the lead at 48% versus 47% for Biden. I am nervous because I like zero room for error, and I would much rather see Trump leading in those polls. But if we compare and contrast— It's never going to happen. —to 2016, if if there's even the same amount of error, which you think there's going to be double, Trump wins. I, I hope—I so hope that is that is correct. I really, really hope so. Again, I am not Miss Cleo. I don't have a crystal ball, but I gauge a lot of what is happening— because I put a lot of stuff on my Facebook. And I'm telling you, back in 2016, I don't think I had quite as many people following me or commenting or liking as what I do. But it seems like every time I put up a political post back then, there was a lot for, comparatively, there was a lot more pro-Trump. People would, like, list, lots of things, comment lots of things. There'd be a lot of shares. Not saying I still don't get a lot of that, but in comparison to the four years, you you get maybe more likes. You don't get nearly the comments, nearly the, you know, shares or things like that as I did. And so I don't think any of those people have changed their mind because, again, the likes are there, but they much rather like something with 1,200 other people and blend in the background than write a comment on there and say why they're supporting Trump or that, you know, Trump's going to win or something against the Democrats in those comments. And so, yeah, I think it's a lot more that way. Again, enthusiasm 
is a real, real thing. I don't care what it is, in whether it's an election or anything. It's a real thing. There is no enthusiasm for Biden other than he is not Trump. And I am telling you what I worried about the most last time was there was a substantial number of Americans, not just female, not just gay. There were some, there were a lot of males too that thought it was time to elect a woman president, which I wholeheartedly believe in. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought we would have a woman president before we had a minority president. And I was wrong there. I think it is time for a woman president. But as I told them four years ago, it has to be the right woman. And she was not in. I hope your hypothesis is correct with, with this one. And the other problem could be on Facebook. Maybe you're not getting as many comments. You could take the other side and say, well, people aren't as excited about Trump right now. I disagree with that because before it was mostly negative and they didn't know that he'd actually stand up there and create some policy or enact some policy that was going to benefit so many Americans. So I, I do believe you're, you're dead on correct. I think it's going the right direction. There is an issue. We can talk about all these things. We can talk about polls. We can talk about enthusiasm. But one thing can change this dramatically, and that's vote by mail. Now, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist. I'm not trying to do any of those things. But I do want to bring out some facts. In 2016, one quarter of the ballots were cast by mail. Most of those were absentee ballots that required some form of verification. Right now, we have a difference. We have absentee ballots, which you actually request, and you, you have some verification there, and you have mass ballot mailings that go out to all the people. Okay, this is a problem from the standpoint in, in many folds. Even on some absentee ballots, there is on the outside of the ballot, sometimes in some states, in some precincts, it indicates whether you're affiliated with the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. What if you're a male person that's very strong on the left and you see all these Republican Party ballots come in? I know what I'd do with them. I'm not saying I need to, to jump into, into the, the mail service just to sway the election, but there are people out there that unfortunately are not going to be as ethical as they, they should be. And this whole universal vote by mail, where states just mail out ballots to all voters, I do not feel comfortable. I do not feel safe with that. And it is for the most part in the state's control, when this will happen. Again, I want to restate, I do not object to the absentee ballots. I think those are very necessary. I think there's a lot of good there. But some type of verification needs to take place. We need, a, as of October, we need a real ID to get on an airplane. But at this point, we do not need any form of ID to determine the fate of our country. That's a problem. No, I agree with you that... Uh... There could be a lot of funky shit go on in that. And I do know that uh, if you watch the interview with Trump and Laura from the Ingram Mangle, uh, he said that they have lawyers positioned in every state that they think that there could be something happen. They're already fighting it. They're fight And he's also fairly confident that the Supreme Court will weigh in on this. At some point before, I don't know how he thinks it's going to happen in the next 62 days, but that's his stance on it. Uh, I agree. It's very concerning in terms of those areas. Uh, I'll tell you what's the most concerning for me. And uh, this is something that if by the time that the inauguration comes around and no one has either conceded or there's not a clear winner or it's still in courts or all this other stuff. There are some plausible theories that the Speaker of the House would take over as President of the United States. Now, how dare you talk like that? I'm not what saying. What are you thinking? What well, are you thinking? Hold on a second now. The last two interviews that Trump has given, he has strongly made the case that they're going to take back the House. And I think this might be part of the reason why. He's not pushing the Senate nearly as hard as he did in 
the midterm election, he's more on this Congress deal. And even if the Democrats keep the House, there's no saying that Pelosi will be elected the Speaker. It could be worse. I think AOC some could her, be worse. Oh, I don't know because Pelosi has done it for so long. She seems to understand that she can get away with absolute lies and just goes and maybe has more experience doing it. But it, it concerns me. And you're right. Trump seems to be more positive that they can take back the House because of Nancy. I, I hope he's correct. I just, I, I really don't know. I don't either. I hope we but, hold the Senate and it'd be great to take over the House, but it it's all concerning to me. And I know Hillary isn't a big thing in the party anymore, but when she put that out there that under no matter what circumstances whatsoever at all, Biden was not to concede this election, that said something to me that that's going to be something that they are going to try. If Biden is such a good and nice and honest guy, like they all claim, and he is incorrect, that I'm saying as they claim, and he is defeated soundly, then I don't see how he can do that. Another thing is Laura Ingram brought up in that interview that they she really thought that he needed to win the popular vote as well as the electoral vote. I think all those things add up to this. And again, I don't know if Trump can win the popular vote. I'm not saying he can't. He is convinced he did win the popular vote last time, that it was election fraud and the third party candidates that cost him the popular vote. I, I'm, I'm not sure that I can go with that or go with him on that statement, but that's what he thinks. So there's a whole lot of balls up in the air. And whether they're caught or they fall down on the ground, I don't know. I, I do. The two things that worry me the most is what Hillary said about him not conceding and then Pelosi saying that she did not want Joe to participate in the debates. And only because whether you like those women, love those women, loathe those women, whatever, I don't care what your take on them on, they are both exceptionally intelligent individuals who normally do not make statements like that unless there is a reason behind it. I have a hard time accepting that they're intelligent. I believe Hillary to be intelligent, and I believe you to be exactly correct that she's going to make a statement, and there's a lot behind it that we aren't aware of, and this could be an absolute mess. I believe Nancy Pelosi is unintelligent, but I think well coached and been doing something for so long, she's kind of got a method to her madness and she's, she's going to push the boat. She's going to push it hard to avoid those debates. I, she's intelligent enough or listening to somebody that she knows Joe will get destroyed. He will, he will fumble like no tomorrow. Those are the things. And again, we're 62 days out and kind of wrapping this up here. Uh, my final thoughts on it are the numbers that we don't get to see the internal polling which is the thing that really matters because as one of the pundits stated the other night, you're not going to pay for someone to lie to you. The internal polling must show that the Hayden biden technique is crashing and burning and their numbers are crashing because they are making the old man come out of the basement. He had to give a 24-minute speech to an empty room with the teleprompter uh, yesterday Tomorrow, him and his wife are going to visit Kenosha. So the whole concept of when he said that he can win the presidential election from his basement and that he was going to, obviously they're saying that's not going to work. The more times he gets out, the more possibility it is that he's going to make a fool out of himself, like yesterday when he said, and I quote, COVID has taken this year, uh, just since the outbreak, uh, has taken then 100 year look. Here's uh, the lives. It's just, it's just, I mean, think about it more lives this year than any other year. Now, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what he was trying to convey there, but that's an exact quote from his 24 minute teleprompter speech yesterday. 
They're making him come out again. He's going to continue to have these problems. I don't think that's going to help anything, but they have come to the conclusion that he cannot continue to stay in the basement and win. So they're going to, he's been forced out. Uh, the other thing is, I do not know if there will be any, I, I don't think there will be any October surprises against Trump. I think they literally threw every single piece of dirt, trash, whatever they could come up with at him the last time. I mean, the Access Hollywood tape came out. Everything that he has done since he came down that escalator forward has been out there for all of the public to see and be ridiculed. So I don't think there's anything that way coming towards Trump. I wonder... Because, again, I pick up on little things that are said. Trump said yesterday at his roundtable in Kenosha or afterwards that A.G. Barr could be go down as the greatest attorney general of all time or just another guy because of the fact that there's this ongoing investigation about the spying that went on in the campaign during Obama and Biden's administration. And now there's another investigation that the DOJ has admitted is going on about who is funding and who is putting the money together for all these rioters, looters, and vandalism. I'm wondering if there's going to be an October surprise that way that hits Biden, whether he is charged or wrapped up in the collusion nonsense that was illegal or some or someone closely affiliated with this campaign is wrapped up in that or wrapped up in supplying the money for the vandalism, the rioters and the looters. I don't know. I just pick up on little things that Trump says and puts out there. Again, a lot of times when he just says general stuff, whatever, but when he makes something specific, like that statement, and he's hint, he did some hinting around to it in the Ingram Angle article. I wonder, again, is there something coming that we don't know about? I, I hope there is, and I, I heard that same statement, and I'm maybe taking a little different perspective. My, that statement concerns me from the standpoint that I think there's a lot of information that's been, been gathered about spying on Trump and the whole Russia scandal that I'm hoping is going to going to be released and and I would rather it's released before the election if they have it release it don't hold it just because there's an election and it almost is to me that he's putting a little pressure on AG Barr to let's get this done. I hope I'm incorrect and I hope that he's not having to talk AG Barr into into going that direction that he will simply jump in with both feet. And I hope that your analogy is correct and I am wrong. I don't know. I just, those are the little things that may go unnoticed by a lot of people. But like when I hear little things like that, I think, hmm. And maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist. I don't know. But I I just pick up on stuff like that. I I do think if there is a September or October surprise, it's got to go against Biden and not Trump. Because literally, I, I don't know what else there is to throw at the man. I think they'll try to throw some old things out. I think they're going to try. I don't think any of it's going to stick at all. Well, I think say, there will be an effort. But there's there's nothing that hasn't – I don't think there's anything new, I guess is what I'm saying. Correct. Yeah, they can bring up old things, but there's nothing new there. No, and, and then so, the old that's already gone through and inside out, I, I just don't see it getting a lot of traction. So, I mean, that's where we're at. But uh, I don't know. Do you have any final thoughts there, Dale? Well, I, I'm going to admit that for a very long portion of my life, I was a part of the silent majority. But the time has come. If we do not stand up and speak out, our country will be much different than you could have ever imagined. And we do not have much time left. And I don't know if it means visiting with your neighbor, your friends, those that you feel are conservatives, and maybe they weren't going to go vote. It has to happen. I don't care if you're in Illinois. I don't care if you're in one of the most conservative states. It doesn't matter. You simply need to get involved, speak out, 
the voices are being heard from the extreme left and it's pushing policy in a direction that I never dreamed it could go. We need to be heard and it's time to do it. I wish it didn't have to happen. I wish I could stay in that silent majority. I don't want to push my feelings and beliefs upon others. I want them to research and come up with their own decision and come up with, with facts and, and, and use those facts to make that decision on who you vote for. And I hope that happens. Ryan, I, I appreciate the discussion today and, and being allowed to come in and just speak very openly about the convention and, and just where we're at on the political side of things. This is something that I'm really passionate about. I love politics and it's not for the faint of heart. And I probably offended a whole bunch of people and that's fine. And especially if this gets out to people that aren't livestock people. So if you snowflakes and liberals are out there listening, I'm sorry, not sorry. But uh, that's just kind of how it is. But again, I've never, my mother says that I came into the world screaming and uh, never shut up. And so I've never been real silent about anything, not been silent about uh, my political beliefs uh, much either. And so, but I do think it's been fun. I hope the listeners enjoyed this special episode and I hope they like it and enjoy it and uh, look forward to not only this one getting out there, but our regular scheduled programming for this week as well. So coming from the conservative gray, I appreciate your comments. There you go. So wrapping up the special episode of beyond the circus, this is the gay and Dale Hummel, and we will see y'all next time.